Hi everyone, my name is Andrew and I'm one of the staff at the Economy Museum at the St. Louis Fed. Today I'm recording from the Temporary Economy Museum, also known as my house. While we can't be with you in person, we thought it would be fun to talk about currency and some of the things that we do here at the Federal Reserve. I'm going to ask you to pause the video a few times to ask you questions and test your knowledge. So be prepared for that as we go through the video. We're going to start with a quiz. So first question, what are these called? If you said notes, bills, currency, or money, you're right. Here's the second question. Can you name the people on these bills? Pause the video and test your knowledge. When you think you have them all, hit play and see if you're correct. Here are the people on the bills. The one is George Washington. The five is Abraham Lincoln. The 10 is Alexander Hamilton. The 20 is Andrew Jackson. The 50 is Ulysses S. Grant, and the 100 is Benjamin Franklin. Now we're missing a bill here. Can anybody guess what it is? If you said the $2 bill, you're correct. The $2 bill has Thomas Jefferson on it. All right, now I have one more question for you, and I promise it's the last one. What was the largest bill ever created? Was it a $1,000 bill, a $5,000 bill, a $10,000 bill, or a $100,000 bill? All right, well, if you said a $100,000 bill, you're correct. It looked like this, and it had Woodrow Wilson on it. Now, it's actually illegal for anyone to have one of these. The reason for that is it only ever circulated inside the Federal Reserve System. Federal Reserve used this bill to transfer large amounts of money around before the invention of the wire transfer. Now we send large amounts of money electronically rather than using a bill. The reason it's illegal to have one is because if you have one, you had to have stolen it from a Federal Reserve bank. So let's look at all of the people on the bills. How would you describe them? The Secretary of the Treasury decides what each of the bills will look like. You might notice that all of the bills have people who have been important to American history, but not all are presidents. Alexander Hamilton was the first Secretary of the Treasury, and Benjamin Franklin made many important contributions to America. The portraits on each of these bills was selected in 1929. One key thing for anyone going on U.S. currency is they must be deceased before going on the bill, so you won't see any recent or current presidents' faces on the bills anytime soon. Now here at the Federal Reserve, one of our jobs is to distribute these bills to the banks within our district. As you see on the map, we in St. Louis are the 8th district. There are 12 regional reserve banks as well as the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. Looking at the map, can you determine where all of the Federal Reserves are located? Pause the video and try to figure this out. Press play again to see if you're right. Alright, so here are the different districts. First district is Boston. The second district is New York. The third district is Philadelphia. The fourth district is Cleveland. The fifth district is Richmond. The sixth district is Atlanta. The seventh district is Chicago. The eighth district, which I gave you earlier, is St. Louis. The ninth district is Minneapolis. The tenth district is Kansas City. The eleventh district is Dallas and the 12th district is San Francisco. If you look at the map, you'll notice that all of the banks are in big cities. The other thing you might notice is most of them are to the east. The reason for this is that the Federal Reserve System was formed in 1913. And if you think about where people lived in 1913, most were on the east coast. There wasn't a big population in California just yet. You can also see some red dots. Those small dots are branch offices. They help spread the reach of the Federal Reserve banks throughout the district. So what do we do here at the Federal Reserve? In short, we're the bank for banks. We hold deposits for banks and store their excess currency in our vaults. We also destroy some of the money that banks send us. Now, why would we do that? It's for two reasons. One is if the bill is unfit for circulation. So if it has writing on it or it's very, very worn down, we'll shred that bill and replace it with a new one. 
good example of this is think about the last time you got change and you got a one or a five that was really wimpy and kind of gross. It probably didn't want to touch it. Those are the types of bills that we shred. The other reason we shred a bill is if it has an old design. We shred those bills to get bills with new security features out into circulation because they're harder to counterfeit. The Federal Reserve also acts as a bank for the U.S. government. We hold checking accounts for the government and take in revenue for the government. If you have a job and you pay taxes, you might receive a tax refund. That check was written out of an account at the Federal Reserve. The Fed is also responsible for managing the money supply for the U.S. The Fed's job is to make sure that the prices of goods and services are relatively stable over time. Just like the Federal Reserve has functions, money has functions too. So what are the functions of money? Well, first, it needs to be a medium exchange. You have to be able to use it to buy things. Second, it needs to be a store of value. It needs to hold its value over time. Third, it has to be a unit of account. It has to tell you how much things are worth. That's why it has a number on it stating its value. For something to be useful as money, it also has to have certain characteristics. First, it has to be portable. This means it needs to be easy to carry around. Second, it has to be durable or long-lasting. What makes bills durable? Well, they aren't actually made out of paper. They're actually a blend of cotton and linen like your clothing. A good way to think about paper not being durable is to think about a receipt from a store. If you leave a receipt in your pocket, then wash your pants, the paper receipt gets destroyed. Now, imagine if that was a $20 bill. You wouldn't be too happy, and that's why our currency is cotton and linen. Third, it has to be generally acceptable. That means people have to take the item as payment for goods or services. Money that is uniform and has a certain shape and size is more readily acceptable. Fourth, it has to be divisible into smaller amounts. This means it has to be able to be broken down to make change. Lastly, it needs to be scarce. This means there cannot be a lot of it. If people had all the money they wanted, money would lose its value. U.S. currency has security features on it to make it hard to duplicate or counterfeit. This helps keep money scarce. We hope you enjoyed our lesson today, and we can't wait to welcome you back to the Economy Museum in person soon. Thanks for watching.